Hello, welcome to our very first uh, Tech Plus for uh, the month of uh, July. It's Ion with you and also Kane. For the next hour, we're talking all things tech. How's it, Kane? Good. We've landed firmly in July this time around, eh? And it's cold. Weather. Tech. It's really cold, eh? It's all speaking like the middle of the year. <laughs> yeah, yo, yeah. Even my diary, like today, I was like right in the middle of my of my diary. You could see the way it was stitched and everything. I was like, damn, it really is. We've arrived. Fifty percent of twenty twenty four is crazy. It's absolutely mental. It it's is absolutely mental. But we've arrived here and on quite the milestone, I must say, because uh, as far as I understand. In the last few days, 4 July 2024 marks 100 days without load shedding. I know, right? And uh, I never thought we'd see the day, eh? Apparently, it's the largest like amount of time we've gone without load shedding in the rotational power cuts in four years. I can that, believe that. It doesn't even feel like 100 days. <laughs> it feels like we've only been without load shedding for like a month. I don't yeah. even know how. Yeah, it just shows you, days. hey. But it's still surreal. I mean, I didn't think we'd see this. Um, in fact, uh, as we entered uh, uh, winter, I thought it was actually going to get much worse. I thought so too. But apparently, this reprieve is also 70 days more than 2023's total days without load shedding. Jeez, <laughs> yeah, I saw some scary stats, hey, like thousands of hours that we had last year last year was scary eh? last year was very scary i mean the fact that those 100 days mark 70 days longer than the longest period of time in 2023 that we went without power means that we only went without we went without power for 30 days basically in uh, in 2023 30 days was the longest amount of time we went without getting load shed and i tell you what it didn't actually feel like that it felt like we had more i, I thought we had more breaks but but kane heavy. what happened to those people who said now, after the elections, it's coming back, huh? Yeah, those those people... Where, where are, are those people I now? might have even been one of them that was like on the <laughs> fence about it. I was unsure. I was like, it, it really... I wouldn't be surprised if it did come back. But where are they now? Well, They're very quiet, eh? I read an interesting article that said <laughs> apparently the load shedding woes were solved by, you know, five people at ESCOM that just thought outside the box. But I didn't read enough into it because in my mind, it's like... This has been a problem. Literally, we're talking about mm. the sixth longest break. So this break, this hundred days, is the is only the sixth longest break that we've had since 2014. Jeez. It seems crazy to me that in a few months you can solve a problem that is almost 14 years old. You know, in 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 three months you've solved the problem that would have taken you know 300 months to get to where we are now with this current problem so i don't know i don't know how solved it is i don't know what they've done to do it but i'm just glad it's not here right now it's just you've got to celebrate the wins i think one of the reasons definitely is uh, the sabotage that stopped Uh, i don't know if they got better security or whatever but you don't hear about stuff exploding anymore or breaking down at uh, the power stations. And that was also one of the big causes of load shedding. Yeah. So those people stopped sabotaging it. But what has changed since then and now? That's the question. Yeah. Why does the sabotage stop? You yeah. Know, it is, it is, it's, and yeah. will it start again? And did if they, it does... Did they overcome the, the threat? Were people, you know, shot who were doing this? Did they, did they no longer exist on the face of the earth, you know, that were causing these sabotaging? Does, was hmm. the, the gangs that were doing it, did they get disbanded? Like, I know there was a, a lot of uh, arrests at one stage, eh? so maybe they got all of them now. I'm just glad, man. I'm just really glad that we can say that we've The gone. tide is turning. And I just can't believe it. It just doesn't feel I mean, the real. international people that I was speaking to were always like just amazed at the stories that were South Africa's load shedding. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, electricity is one part of it. Fuel is another. And uh, this is pretty interesting. We've had quite the fuel station shakeup in South Africa yeah. over the last few months, I must say. Yeah, just seeing all these new canopies at... Uh at the uh, petrol station. What is hey? that one it's now? Totally rebranded. Replaced Avron, I think. Astron. Astron Energy. Yeah, uh, that replaced uh, Caltex. 
So South African motorists can expect significant changes in the country's fuel station market over the coming years. The most recent development was Dutch Swiss oil giant VTOL Energy subsidiary Vivo Energy finalizing its acquisition of 100% of engine stations in South Africa. The company announced the transaction's completion shortly after the competition tribunal approved Vivo Energy's purchase of Malaysian firm's Petron's 74% stake in engine. Engine. engine has over this is crazy i didn't think it was this many engine has over <laughs> 1300 local service stations in south africa 1300 imagine you have a business in south africa <laughs> and it has 1300 locations across <laughs> south africa <laughs> oh. that's nine provinces that's 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 like more than 100 in each in each province and uh, it makes it the country's biggest fuel distributor. And also Viva Energy becomes the, acquis- the acquisition company of South Africa's largest network of fuel distribution. Vivo Energy has over 2,600 stations across 27 other African countries. Kind of shows you how big Engine's presence in, is in South Africa if Vivo has double the amount of stations but over 26 other countries as well you know so these stations operate either under the engine or shell brands following the acquisition vivo energy will have a vast network of about 4,000 stations over more than half of africa's countries one major benefit of the takeover for engine will be access to a significantly larger international fuel distribution network as part of the transactions conditions vtol uh, committed to investing 10 billion rand in south africa's retail and fuel infrastructure and solar energy generation over the next five years that's interesting to me you know what 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 value does someone like VTOL have to committing to invest 10 billion rand in South Africa's retail and fuel infrastructure by being a purchaser of engine and was this 10 billion rand investment or commitment to retail and fuel infrastructure a component of that deal did they have to say that we will do this if you sell your company to us or did they just buy the company and decide hey you know, because we've bought this, we're not just going to buy it and stop. We're going to continue to invest. So we'll say we're, we're going to commit $10 billion. So I wonder what the terms of that deal was, if they had to actually commit to that deal in order to access that, uh, that opportunity. But nonetheless, um, definitely a disruption in, in, our, in our knowledge of the existing fuel station network in South Africa. And it's definitely, I mean, Shell, Engine, these were like, these are like well-recognized uh, fuel stations, and yeah. now they're going to be completely Now you've different. got all these, like, yeah, it's almost like they're from space, these new ones, eh? <laughs> they are quite branded, I'm not going to lie. The colors, eh? It's so different. But uh, also, it was nice to see uh, a bit of a reprieve on the petrol and diesel price front this week. Petrol went down about one rand or so. Always Wednesday. good to see that. I was very, very welcome. Speaking of petrol, I mean, when I speak to our international, some of our international colleagues and things like that, they're mind blown at the service we receive at a fuel station. They can't believe that when you pull up at a fuel station, you don't have to get out your car, you don't have to go grab a pump, you don't have That's to wash so nice. your own window, I must say, hey? you don't have to fill your own oil. You know, these guys will come to your car. It's like a valet service. It's it's actually a luxury here in South Africa. And to other people in other countries, they Overseas. get out their car to go grab the pump themselves. In the States, man, you got to do it all yourself. Can you imagine what would happen to you if you pulled up at a fuel station and just get out and start grabbing the petrol attendant's pump and start <laughs> filling your Eyeball. own car? What is going to happen? <laughs> will he fight you? Oh, if you go to America, you just sit in your car and you wait for someone. <laughs> it's just like day two at the petrol station. No one's helping me. Everybody's looking at you. <laughs> You're right. It, it's actually quite a, a luxury. I, I think even in the UK, they've got to put in their own uh, petrol. They do. And what blows my mind is they don't actually have to put in their own petrol, but if they want to wash their windscreen, they have to do it themselves. <laughs> you know, if they want to fill their oil, they have to do it themselves. I'm pretty nervous that if someone who's not like a car savvy person <laughs> in South Africa goes overseas, they're going to sit there with like this oil and be like, I don't know where this goes. Yeah. I don't know what to do next. <laughs> yeah, this is just You're a right. Hey? You're right. They're actually quite spoiled in that way. You that know? is actually very, very interesting. Uh, then we're also taking a look at um, some major Take A Lot marketplace changes. You've bought, how much do you think in total you've bought from Take A Lot? 10 parcels in the last year? 100 parcels in the last year? Mm, yeah, it's probably, I wish it was 100. It's probably 10, yeah. 
a hundred is one every three days. So you like you regularly <laughs> nah. receiving parcels. Ah, uh, no, not that often, eh? And nah. you? I mean, I will. I'll order. I'll order occasionally. It's sometimes something small, something big. Yeah. But I definitely utilize it a lot. But one deterrent for me definitely is when you see an item is like in stock, but three to five days. Does that ever deter you from checking that item out? Um, because it's not going to get you in in one to three days, but maybe five to seven days. That's if it's closer, you know, if I can get it closer, then obviously I'll go with that. Yeah. So you always kind of look. You balance out price and availability. Is, yeah. Is it worth the wait? That's always the question as well. Yeah. So apparently, price. take a lot has increased the portion of sellers' products that need to be held in stock at its two main distribution centres. In an apparent attempt to boost sales and speed up delivery times. However, many sellers have taken issue with the new policy as take a lot blocks them from replenishing stock at one or the other um, distribution centers, making it difficult to meet the requirements. Take a lot first notified sellers about the changes to the seller service level agreement SLA in May 2024. The adjustments came into effect from 1st July 2024. And they went on to say that to keep our customers smiling, we now require that at least 80% of all in-stock products be available across our distribution centers. This is what Take A Lot said and also went on to say that this is super important because it means more of our customers can take advantage of those speedy delivery options. Our data tells us that these products are two to three times more likely to sell. And I would agree. If you're going to see, it's going to be a... Okay, so for Nasna people, it's a little bit different because we don't have that super valuable overnight, same-day delivery service. But we just saw Take A Lot go live with Take A Lot More, where Take A Lot More allows you to basically pay a subscription every month and you get a couple of free same-day deliveries, a couple of free overnight deliveries, and I guess just some, some, some other basic benefits like you can also get free deliveries with mr d delivery and and that sort of stuff so i think this is also an effort to make that service more valuable to its users because a person will definitely sit there and be like what's the point in having free same day delivery if most of the stuff i want to buy is three to five five to seven day delivery time then I have no value in having this same day delivery service in the same way that someone in Neisner or Plett or Sedgefield or Mossel Bay or even in between PE and you know Neisner or between Cape Town and Neisner, they're going to be a regional area. So how do they get the same benefits out of the to- Take A Lot More subscription? What makes them want to spend that money every single month? Because for Take A Lot, it's a numbers game. They need to get as many numbers and as many people on the subscription as possible. So I'm specifically interested to see how they offer that value to us regional area users and customers. You know, How are you going to make that subscription valuable to me? Are you going to bring a warehouse down to the garden root area? Because right now the garden root area is completely un- underwhelmed in terms of warehouse availability. We mm. have pickup points, meaning you can go pick up your item or you can go drop off your item without having to actually have people come to your house. But that doesn't mean that they have a warehouse here that's going to quickly pick up your phone cover and drive it to you on the same day. So I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of solutions come there. But it all starts with getting more products from the sellers that use take a lot as a middleman and getting those products inside their distribution centers because they know that if it's in the distribution center if that thing says in stock they're probably more likely to buy it and it's going to boost sales and hopefully help them expand their warehouse um, kind of infrastructure but very very interesting to see them make that change and actually be in the process of implementing it so if you are a take a lot seller what does that mean for you well that means if you're going to sell something on take a lot and i imagine if it means if you're going to sell something to a quantity of 10 let's say you have 10 laptops eight of them have to be at take a lot's distribution centers so 80 percent of your stock has to be at a distribution center in order for you to start selling that stock i imagine so i think that was very very interesting um, and also another interesting thing is apparently FMB has been having trouble with their chat support. So much so that it's actually making people pretty irritated. FNB has apparently blamed a decline in service quality on its secure chat feature on intermittent incidents during an upgrade of the system necessitated by an increased user demand. In the past few weeks, My Broadband has observed numerous complaints on social media platforms like Twitter or X about secure chat's quality of service being poor. Something is terribly wrong with FNB. 
someone went on to say, they said that your secure chat staff is painfully incompetent and is of no assistance to us, another user posted. Uh, one user also said that FNB needs to go back to giving private clients bankers because they cannot stand their secure chat service suit. And someone else said, please get someone to call me. I am done with your call centers. I am also done with your service secure chats. It's a waste of my time. So that's definitely a case of a feature that isn't being taken too, too kindly. And it might be just because it has no high end throughput. Meaning if I have this secure chat and I have a problem and it doesn't solve my problem, but it took me three hours to chat, that's a problem. So that's obviously causing some irritation. And I'm sure some people out there might have... Uh, might have experienced this problem and then i also saw a lot of stuff about um i think it was standard bank had a lot of fraudulent the transactions scams, and yeah, that i saw that hey? so much so that i i even went <laughs> some people were like you better check your bank make sure everything's good so i go into my banking app and i'm like the first thing i see is a message like do you think you've been a victim of fraud or scamming? And I'm like, Ooh. oh no, oh no, <laughs> Am I, is, is this about to go bad? Check the balances. But quick, no, quick. L- luckily I was okay. But I think oh, okay. they did have a, an infrastructure problem. So it's like, oh. a, was there like a, a loophole or something for the guys to get in? I wonder. I don't know if they had a system failure or they had an exploit, but it definitely wasn't, didn't go down well. And I know a lot of people actually lost some money there. Oh my! But word. I'm sure not Standard true. Bank will. Uh, We'll sort them out. They are a bank after all. You know, it's not like a little 7-Eleven store somewhere. <laughs> it's just not going to get helped. You know, so there is hope down that alley. But is it time for a music break? It sure is. Stay tuned for more Tech Plus. Welcome back to uh, Tech Plus on a cold uh, Saturday uh, all across uh, the Western Cape. It's Jan with you and also Kane. And uh, we're unwrapping uh, and unpacking and unboxing this week's uh, biggest tech stories. Kane, what have you got for us next? Next up, remember we've spoken about cloud gaming? Yes. Do you remember that? And you don't need a, 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 a PC with all the fancy resources and stuff. Yeah, so a few years ago, you know, if you want to get into gaming, you may, maybe you're a parent and your kid's saying, you know, I want a, I want a, I want a gaming computer, or, or maybe you're a gamer yourself and you're going from console to computer, or whatever the case is, you want a game and you need equipment to game, and that equipment costs money. And that was always the biggest problem, was the better you want your gaming experience to be, the more money you have to pay on equipment to do that. Mm. And the more money you spend on equipment, for example, if you put, you know, if you buy the best screen in the world and it's, you know, it's 4K, it's, it's crisp as heck, it's got a high refresh rate, that computer that you buy to pair with that screen has to be equally good in order to be able to perform at the level that the screen can operate. So the more money you spend, the more money you spend kind of problem. Until cloud gaming, a service that you could basically subscribe to, which is facilitated by Rain, you know Rain, the ISP. I knew Rain because of their unlimited data plan on a SIM card campaign. That's how I first heard about the Rain network. Um, but actually, they have quite a sophisticated network, so much so that NVIDIA actually partnered with Rain. And if you don't know what NVIDIA is, they're now the third most wealthiest uh, company in the world that offer you know gaming hardware and AI hardware, of which the AI hardware has done particularly good in the last two years, so much so that they're obviously now competing for second and first place in terms of world's most valuable company. However, they launched the cloud gaming service with Rain, specifically in South Africa, allowing a local service to basically enable users to use a device like a laptop or a computer or a TV or a tablet or a mobile phone and the hardware restra- or the hardware uh, strain that would normally be experienced by the device you buy to play the games now is done off of the local hardware. It's done on a server somewhere. Um, in Cape Town or Johannesburg. So somewhere there is a server room that has processors and graphics cards that are doing all the heavy lifting so that you can play this game without needing to put that kind of marcher or price or money in in order to actually be able to experience the same level of gameplay. And the only setback is the fundamentally hardest part about providing the service, which is something called latency, which is how long does it take for me to push a button on my keyboard and it go to the server and come back to my screen. 
you know that that is that is essentially what it is so this cloud gaming people would i thought you know maybe if a few hundred people are going to play it you know maybe maybe south africa could see some uptick i was unsure of how well it would do but you know when i bought our new tv i noticed that it already had the cloud gaming installed you could jump on and start playing playstation 5 games right away with the tv no playstation 5 needed but actually its success has been phenomenal um, it not only is it South Africa's first cloud gaming streaming service, but it is also on a roll. NVIDIA's GeForce Now users in South Africa have racked up over 6 million minutes on the cloud streaming service since it launched locally in December 2023. This is feedback from NVIDIA's official local partner for GeForce Now, mobile network operator Rain. GeForce Now allows gamers without the necessary hardware to stream and play over a thousand titles via the internet to a range of devices such as desktops, laptops, tablets, and mobile phones. The service uses dedicated gaming servers equipped with the hardware necessary in order to provide you with your gaming. And to roll out the local infrastructure, Rain was the partner in question. And since they believe that uh, this is going to be a really popular service. And one really interesting fact is they found that the games that were majority played on the, on the GeForce Now service weren't actually games that require a lot of processing power. They're actually games that are more multiplayer popular. They're games such as Fortnite and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and Destiny 2 and Apex Legends and a game called Jensen Impact are regularly featured in the top five most played games. But that's a South African service that's doing pretty damn well. Um, here's an example. If you're going to play, let's say, you know, an average of three hours a day, you're going to play at 1080p, you want 60 frames per second with ray tracing, you're going to pay 200 rand a month. For you to buy this equivalent hardware, probably cost you 12 to 15,000 rand. Only 200 rand a month, that's so really good. 200 rand a month. And if you want yeah. to have access to like a, a super strong system, like a mega rig, 4K capable, 120 FPS, and eight hours per day playing, 400 rand a month. Yo, that's really And that really computer good. will cost you 35 to 40,000 rand. So cloud Without gaming the all the way, even. man. So cloud gaming, man, it turns out to be all affordable. Way. I mean, if you're like, I want to play games for six months, you know, I don't want to spend that kind of money right now. Six months times 400 is what, 2,000 rand? So it costs you 2,000 rand opposed to 55,000 rand to start gaming at 4K. Uh, obviously, that's, you know, it's going to be over a period of time, but not too bad, eh? And then obviously you need good internet. But did you mention you, you got a new TV? No, that was a while ago. Oh, so, so, okay, but no, when I got new, it, new. Okay. I went from Stone Age to okay. New Age. and the Stone thing, Age? Really? I don't believe it. Man, my TV was so heavy, you needed two people to move it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when your TV's heavier, I, uh, front or back. Uh, we need to do a follow-up story on those TVs that you said would just spontaneously collapse in those houses remember oh yes <laughs> the legs just gave up <laughs> the wall bounce i wonder how that's going for the people <laughs> not well not well nothing to like christen a nice dinner with family than the tv falling off the wall or, or thinking somebody's breaking in at 3 a.m and it's a tv what i have for you next is gonna absolutely blow your mind we're talking gaming. Everybody's like, I always think that gaming is, is evolved so fast that people haven't noticed how fast it's evolved. Mm. Because we're talking about NVIDIA streaming services and some people out there might say, well, why, why would you want to, you know, why would you want to buy these services so you can play games on your TV, you know? Why not just do it properly? And uh, why play games at all, you know, is, is often some of the questions. But this latest eSports World Cup prize money is insane. Now, we spoke a while ago in a previous tech show where we spoke about Dubai trying to get into the gaming world, trying to become a hub for esports. And this is their first venture into it. So listen to this. So um, there are about 1,500 gamers competing for a prize at the latest esports tournament uh, in Ryder, uh, which is in Dubai. There are 1,500 gamers competing for a prize pool of dot, 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 60 million dollars yo that's 1.1 billion rand prize pool okay Yikes. this is not only a record for esports but it's also triple the potential payout of the pro golfers maze pga championship 
Okay, so these esports players are playing for f- three times more money than your pro golfers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and funny. is on par with Wimbledon. <laughs> Wimbledon, <laughs> yo, this is getting. <laughs> It's getting serious. Guys, come on. Esports is on par with Yo, Wimbledon. Three I never times knew, hey? more prize money than the PGA Open. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. That's crazy. Where does that, e- where did that even come from? I never knew that's possible, yeah. Imagine you that's as crazy. team, you go home with a, with casual 500 million rand from gaming. Yeah. I wonder how many months of GeForce experience you can get yeah, with that. And you don't even have to stand outside and hit a ball. My word, you don't even have to <laughs> you don't even have to see the sun. Yes. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> so the wow. UAE Kingdom hopes the event featuring twenty one games from developers including Microsoft, Activision, Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Tencent Holdings, Riot Games will be the biggest triumph yet in its mission to become a global epicenter for esports. Well I'll tell you what, bro. You're doing one point one billion Rand prize pools. For esports tournaments, you're gonna to get some attention. That is insane money. That's no longer that's no longer esports as a small man's sport. That's just that's just insane. It's that's absolutely crazy. So that's the esports World Cup. Um, that'll be coming up soon, and you're, I'm sure we'll be doing some coverage of that. But absolutely insane. Sixty million dollars. I mean, that's more than UFC sometimes. So I'm just like I'm mind blown at that fact alone. To be totally honest. Uh, in next in news, we have some new um, tech coming from our you know tech focused companies like Samsung, for example, with their Galaxy Buds 3. Now, I don't know if you have any AirPods, Eon. You never wanted AirPods? Uh, I wouldn't mind some. Uh, uh, those wires are getting really annoying. It's like the Christmas lights, you know. I after, haven't seen untangling a them after a year. It's I haven't delicious. seen a person rocking earphone cables in a while. Only me. Have it's you? only me. Yeah. The closest thing I've seen is headphone cables. <laughs> yeah, let's you know? start on those as well. <laughs> but this is pretty interesting. So the next, so we know Apple AirPods, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, I think we're on now. And we have Samsung Galaxy Buds, Gen 1 and Gen 2. So if you hear Samsung Galaxy Buds 2, it's arguably older than Samsung Galaxy Buds 3. In the same way that if you hear about Apple AirPods Gen 1, it's older than Apple AirPods Gen 3. One would argue that the Gen 3 is the later tech. So those are going to be more expensive. And the Gen 1s are first generation. So Galaxy Buds Gen 3 are supposedly coming out soon. But someone on Reddit apparently went up to a US store a Walmart US store paid $250 and walked out with the new Samsung Galaxy Buds 3. That's crazy. Imagine imagine you like an Apple fan or a Samsung fan and you go into a shop and you just check iPhone 16. Just, you know, it's not out yet and here it is in the shop and you can just buy it some lucky streak. But uh, the Samsung Galaxy Buds 3 are coming out, which will be interesting for anyone that uses AirPods with Samsung. The problem is they're not very interchangeable. I use my Samsung Galaxy Pods 2 on my iPhone, but it just lacks the seamless integration that, that you would want from it. Also, with the, the same with the, with the watches. You know, you can have a Samsung watch. I'm sure you can pair it with an Apple, but I haven't been able to pair my Samsung watch with an Apple. I don't know if you'd be able to pair an Apple watch with a Samsung, but you would be able to do probably that with Garmin or something like that. So these wearables are getting complicated because now, you know, you're going to spend the same amount of money you'd spend on a phone on like an Apple watch, for example, the same amount. And then you'd probably spend like four or five thousand rand on a pair of earphones for the for the Apple. And now you decide I'm going to go Samsung. And what might be a quick decision like, hey, now, I've, you know, I was Apple. Now I'm Samsung. Well, I was Samsung. Now I'm Apple. What you don't realize is there's there's earphones, there's wireless chargers, and there's watches and soon will probably be classes even all for this phone that is no longer compatible so the decision to change brands is going to become harder and harder because the amount of of accessories one would sell with the device and the price of these accessories is actually quite absorbent to the point where i think what we'll see is from the second hand markets you might see full kitted combos where you have the phone the airpods Mm. the, the watch you know the charges 
everything all in one bundle because what if you just sell your phone what's the use of these accessories yeah if you go from apple to samsung and nothing works on samsung what's the you have a watch a twelve thousand rand watch that can't work properly with your phone <laughs> so we're getting a bit of an uncharted territory in terms of phone accessories and things like that be interesting to to watch as that progresses speaking of uh samsung apparently they've seen 15x increase in profits uh basically from their ai if you make ai chips so samsung is apparently making some ai chips um and from that they have increased their profits quite dramatically um so samsung is actually the world's largest memory chip smartphone and tv maker estimated its operating profit rose to 10.4 trillion one or 7.54 billion dollars or you know 140 billion rand in the first uh, in the quarter which just ended now in on june 30th so basically almost double the the amount of money in revenue uh then we have a nintendo remember nintendo wii man those course, were so yeah. good with the tennis the wii yeah. and the basketball and the golf yep and your friends did you ever have a wii always have a wii <laughs> that does sound a bit <laughs> do you ever have a nintendo <laughs> wii u uh, yes no i i i had a wii you did yes and did you play it and the ps3 oh really both what? at the same time no <laughs> oh separate times yeah what do you think you played more the wii or the playstation the wii was nice because it was like more uh interactive i think so this is quite a, a big a big day for any wii fans because in nintendo japan will no longer repair the Wii U. A year after Nintendo Japan announced it would stop repairing the Wii U when its supply of parts ran out, the company confirmed this week its Japanese support teams are no longer able to fix the 12-year-old console because they no longer have spare parts for it. So that's the end of an era, really. Oh, that's quite sad. If you have your Wii U, keep it alive. It might be worth a lot of money one day. Yeah. A lot of money. Keep it. Especially if you, if, if you don't have to, like, dust it off and you know do a whole bunch of stuff just to get it like keep it in good condition you know keep it for 30 years if you can it might definitely be worth a fair penny in some time definitely definitely uh here's very interesting as well general motors has to pay a fine uh after causing more carbon pollution than it said it would so emissions from nearly six million of its vehicles were about 10 percent higher on average than general motors said they were on its greenhouse gas emissions this isn't the first time we've heard about a car manufacturing company kind of shifting their emissions data we heard about VW who actually made a device that would detect when emissions were being tested and would reduce that emissions. They learned the lesson the hard way on that one. They had to pay many B billions in order to, to get to that one. Luckily, General Motors came out a little bit less scathed in this one. They will uh, have to retire 50 million metric tons of carbon credits to make up for the excess tailpipe pollution, which roughly comes to about $145 million in penalties that they'll have to pay for that slight oversight. When I think about it, though, do I think that 6 million vehicle sales, right, would be, like, do, you, do I think the profit from 6 million vis- uh, vehicle sales will exceed 145 million dollars definitely so it's almost like does general did general motors do it knowing that they would get fined because if they could fake you know 10 percent values of their emissions and sell six million vehicles 143 million dollars is probably not much in the greater scheme of six million vehicles so mm. i always wonder like was it intentional? Was it was it strategic? Was it a, was it a strategic play that they did to do that process? Because 145 million is not a lot on six million vehicle sales. When one vehicle can be a million rand or a hundred thousand dollars, for example, six million times a hundred thousand dollars equals way more than 135 million. Exactly. Uh, so that that's pretty interesting. And then really talking about old tech retiring, like the Wii U console, Japan finally quits the floppy. Now this is ah. a, this is a crazy stat. Listen to this. 
So apparently, we have won the war on floppy disks as of June 28, said Japan's digital minister Taru Kono uh, to Reuters for its report. Japan's government has finally eliminated the use of floppy disks in all its systems, two decades since their heyday, reaching a long-awaited milestone in a campaign to modernize the bureaucracy. Listen to this. Back in 2019, the U.S. finally stopped using 8-inch floppy disks to coordinate the country's nuclear forces. 2019! <laughs> you're telling I, me... I haven't seen one in ages. You're Do you still have a floppy? Five years ago is when the U.S. decided, you know, maybe we shouldn't, you know, control our nuclear tech through floppies. You Do know? you still have a floppy? Never! Never. No way, not even in a, in a storage box or something. Bro, I wasn't even, I wasn't even around when taking floppies in and out of computers was a thing. Wow, I, only I used to do, take stuff to drive. the printers on a floppy on a disk. floppy, four megabytes. Yep. Hey. A Word document. Jeepers. Yeah, on a oh. floppy disk or a stiffy, sometimes we called it a stiffy as well. Dude. And then sometimes it would go corrupt and you get to the printers and then they're like, oh, no, but there's nothing on the disc. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. Uh, yeah, I suppose we could have emailed it. Imagine going, getting to the nuclear that. site and be like, all we need is the floppy to deactivate the nuke. And it's like, it's corrupted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's how World War Three started. Yeah. Corrupted floppy disk. Yeah. 2019 wow. problems. Well, it's good to know that we've moved away from that it's literal Stone Age tech. Yeah. Four geez. megabytes can fit on one of those sometimes maybe 10 megabytes is the yeah they were quite small actually that is right? insane and then the usb uh flash drive or stick came uh, around and uh, we never looked back yeah and then we we got so good with flash memory that we turned a flash drive it's quite interesting we had a floppy and then we created a mechanical hard drive and then we created a flash drive to use flash memory. And we said, oh, this flash memory is quite nice. Let's make a big flash drive. And then we'll call it uh, an NVMe. And now that's the new age hard drive. It's just a really big flash memory device. So floppies were modernized by mechanical hard drives, which were modernized by flash-based USB drives, which then modernized the mechanical hard drives into flash memory drives which is your new age memory so flash drives actually inspired the new type of memory uh, standard that we use for you know for most modern pcs now so that's actually quite interesting let's go for some music and then uh, when we come back we have some more tech news welcome back to uh, tech plus on this uh, saturday with myself jan and also kane i see a uh, google Google's goal of uh, reducing its climate footprint is in jeopardy uh, because it's relying on more and more energy-hungry data centers to power its new artificial intelligence products. The tech giant revealed this week that its greenhouse gas emissions have climbed 48% over the past five years. Uh, Google said the electricity consumption by data centers and supply chain emissions were the primary cause of the increase. It also revealed in its annual environmental report that its emissions last year had risen 13% compared with the previous year, hitting 14.3 million metric tons. We don't realize how much uh, AI consumes when it comes to electricity, eh? Well, you know? whether it's AI, cryptocurrency mining, or, you know, just general, general, general software. I mean, it, there's actually a crazy amount of, of power consumption. Why is it so, it? why is it so energy hungry, these AI machines? Is it, is it all that processing power or, you know, what, why? I think when you get to a point where the more power you put in, the more processing you get out, it's inevitable in the hunt for more processing to consume more power. You know, it's it's almost like inevitable because our goal is more output. Yeah. The way to achieve more output is more power in the most linear fashion. So therefore, in the hunt for more output, we end up using more power. And when you use a little bit more power, when you, when you have systems that slowly but surely use more power, but also get optimized and end up using less power, while at the same time the rate of adoption increases significantly, although your hardware might use 50% less power than it did five years ago, there is 500 times more people using it. 
and therefore that probably also contributes to this massive amount of power consumption that is happening. Mm. And uh, that, that for me, is, is the most interesting thing about human behavior. It's like <laughs> we will chase to get better performance while also trying to optimize, but at the same time accelerate adoption to the point where the optimization is no longer readable as a, as a benefit. It is now compounding as a negative because of the sheer rate of adoption that we're experiencing. Very, yeah. very interesting. Mm. Apparently, Apple's also rumored uh, something called a HomePod with a screen could arrive with Apple intelligence. So Apple's smart home efforts could use both a smarter Siri and a smarter display. Um, and Mac Rumors has discovered code that indicates Apple is working on a new home accessory 17.1 that could be powerful enough to run Apple intelligence. Existing home pods seem unlikely to be able to support the AR, so new smart home hardware seems inevitable. So we might get smart home hardware that controls your lights that has AI and that can you know, watch you move around your house and say, he wakes up on average at 6.30, therefore we'll make sure the lights are on. And all mm. kind of smart home tech such as that will probably start coming out as well. And then we have some more news. Meta shows off 3D Gen, an AI tool that creates textured models faster than ever. So this is something that we spoke about many months ago, actually, when we were talking about a lot, about a lot of image generation through AI, where you have um, companies like Midjourney and even Dali that recently partnered, well, not a few months ago, partnered with OpenAI to create their LLM image generation technology. Uh, one of the biggest difficulties was going, it's like, great, we can get a 2D image, but now how do we go from 2D image to 3D asset? And really, this is what Meta has been pioneering here and what they showed off. So Meta's AI research team has a new system to create or retexture 3D objects based on a new or a existing text prompt. It combines text to 3D and text to texture generation models to go beyond AI-generated emoji or still images. Their paper claims 3D Gen's output is 3x to 60x faster and preferred by professional artists in comparison to alternatives. So that's pretty crazy. We're going to see some more 3D generation, meaning we might get to a point where people end up making games based on text prompts to an asset generator that makes a 3D asset based on some text that you put in, and you can end up making a game not having any 3D design experience at all or something like that, right? That's kind of where that could be going. And also four volunteers spent more than a month pretending to be stuck on Mars. Their simulated mission to Mars tested how future astronauts may react to isolation and confinement during deep space journeys. According to NASA, the crew of four went through 18 health studies during their stint at a 650 square foot habitat at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, outside of each other's company, the crew kept four pet tree uh, shrimp, Buzz Alvin, Simon and Theodore. So you can go read about that 45 day simulated journey to Mars. But it obviously is quite important that NASA and, and these guys do some like testing on mental health awareness on but, how being isolated for six months going to Mars might just affect people before they even get there. But two people are actually stuck in space right now. I heard about that. <laughs> just to add oil to the fire. Oh, my word. This is, listen, this is such a terrible story. I was reading it a few times this week in the news and I just couldn't believe it. These Starliner astronauts. They uh, NASA saying no 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 they're not stranded they're just delaying coming back but to me it really looks like they're stranded they're not sure how they're gonna come back it's Butch Wilmore and uh, a lady called Sunny Williams they now they've now been in space for three weeks after their journey was sidetracked by mechanical problems and was um, that the mechanical problems on that uh, on that uh, on that one space shuttle that was leaking helium yes. That's it. So they're the ones that are stranded. Yeah, so now they're worried about coming back, you know. But imagine this. Yo, I can actually see this. Uh, I, hope, I hope this is not going to be another tragedy like that submarine thing. Jeepers, no. Hey? I hope not, bro. How are they going to come back? Imagine. Mommy's coming back next week. Just stuck in space at the moment. She's kind of just... She, she's a few <laughs> hundred thousand kilometers away <laughs> in a vacuum of space. <laughs> Don't worry, mommy is coming back. <laughs> Sorry. In worst case scenario, she's going to take one big jump. <laughs> <laughs> one, one small step. <laughs> you see that blip in the sky. That's, that's one giant leap for man. <laughs> Literally one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> Can you imagine? What did you do? If it was your choice to die on the space station, I think I'd just throw myself back towards the earth. Yo. You'd probably die in the re-entry, re but it's better Definitely. to die like You'll that. Definitely. You'll burn up. There won't be anything left. 
definitely what a view <laughs> yeah I, I think you would have an, a, an amazing a view and also you'll be closer to heaven yeah. which is quite nice and you'll go quickly and also probably catching on fire <laughs> during your descent at least the wind will but keep you cool shame I hope they're going to come back you know obviously they want them to come back safely and they're not 100% confident in uh, the setup the way it is right now so that's why they're delaying it but i mean how long can they actually stay up there before everything just runs out they'll probably just pull a pay spacex to fix their problem kind of solution because they do that a lot you know is it even spacex has been uh, has been tended to to actually destroy the international space station when its use expires at the end ah. of 2025 oh wow that's quite soon yeah so they have to figure out a mission plan to basically send something to the international space station and then force it back into reorbit and in forcing it back to reorbit with a lot of math and many zeros carried it'll dissolve itself and, hmm. and explode before making its way back into earth well hopefully by that time the people are back here on planet oh, earth. i'm just saying at least you'd just be glad i'm not figuring that one out because yes, i would like imagine b- butch that one imagine i mean it's it's one thing being stuck uh, on a, a a boat in the sea but i mean being stuck stuck in space you're not even on the planet where, you were born where on where would you rather be stuck in space <laughs> at the space station or 300 3000 meters under the water in a metal submarine that's cracking oh god I'm no fine. I'll, just, both, I'll, I'll, both I'll, I'll just stick to my on land adventures <laughs> both you know, are just horrible like, like there's no good answer to any of them <laughs> no there's no answer I'd pick none of them same I, yeah i pick chicken fence life just absolutely <laughs> not doing that. So apparently, ne- remember Netflix, we spoke about it. They did a few things. The first thing they did is they said, no more account sharing. Yeah. You may not share your account anymore. Then they said, well, if you want to share your account, you can get a- another subscription, but it's smaller. It's a smaller subscription. Oh, yeah. Added yeah. on to your existing subscription. And then they said, if you don't want to pay a lot of money for that, though, you can use the ad tier. Mm-hmm. So apparently Netflix is following through on its plan to phase out its cheapest ad-free tier for existing subscribers, as spotted in numerous posts on Reddit. Netflix is now asking some basic plan subscribers to choose a new plan to stay subscribed to Netflix. One Reddit user received a notification on the Netflix app saying your last day to watch Netflix is to July 13. Choose a new plan to keep watching. Subscribers paying $11.99 a month, this is America obviously, for the basic plan will have to choose either the $7 ad-supported tier, the $15.49 ad-free tier, or the $22.99 ad-free 4K premium plan tier. But I just find it quite funny that Netflix brings this whole ad-free tier and then starts phasing it out a few months later um, and basically forcing people to spend more money than they were originally spending on Netflix. But in retrospect, you know, seven dollars a month is not so bad for Netflix, to be honest. It's not, no, not it's at worse all. Worst things to spend your money on, and in South Africa, yeah. it works out even cheaper. I think it's like sixty rand a month or something like that. It's absolutely peanuts, nothing at all. Mm. Now, here's something that that I found quite interesting. Were you the type of kid to run around with Audi shoelaces tied? Or yeah, did you really? Eh? Yeah. Did you ever like bail, just completely, you know, fall but block the fall with your face, kind of thing? Did you ever just bail? I think so, yeah. I think I bailed many times. And it's yeah. the most awkward way to rough. bail as well because it's just one foot no longer works properly. Yeah. So apparently, um, despite the ongoing popularity of the Back to the Future trilogy that inspired the self-lacing tech found in the HyperAdapt 1.0 and Air Mags, Nike has announced that it's no longer creating new version of Adapt shoes. Now the Adapt BB mobile app used to control the $350 third iteration of Nike self-lacing sneakers will disappear from the Google Play and iPhone app store next month. Would you spend arguably what could be close to 7,000 Rand on shoes that you can use an app to have the lace? be tied for you no you? way no, no way, way. No. So la- would you tying your laces didn't take that much time out your day no <laughs> not 7,000 rand worth definitely not I don't need th- I, I just actually keep them tied sometimes my nightmare is just that it will stop self-lacing or it will do it badly like one will be tight and the other will be pretty loose so there's Yo, just no way to like get no, around that that's just being lazy now eh? and do self-lacing You're- shoes if you have self-lacing <laughs> shoes can you turn it to manual mode like what if your battery runs out? You have to charge your shoes to tie your laces. <laughs> you know? No, oh my word, no! I can't even believe that. Bro, why do your do shoes this? keep falling off your feet? It's like I flip and forgot to charge them again <laughs> last night. Third That's a conversation you're gonna have soon in the future. <laughs> it's just crazy. You're, then you're gonna get wireless charging 
welcome mats so that when you walk into your house your shoes get a little charge or something ah that's a that's a brilliant idea <laughs> well this technology you must get a a, a patent on that one <laughs> <laughs> and apparently uh meta or whatsapp is developing a personalized ai avatar generator so if you really didn't like that profile picture of yours do not fret there's very likely that you'll just be able to fake what you look like to other people oh. with just a prompt it could be like you know Sorry. chris hemsworth meets flippin Chris Rock. Jeez, I would love that, actually. <laughs> Chris Rock, though. Chris Rock's like a bit of a weird guy. No, the Hemsworth part. I would like. <laughs> the Hemsworth part. Yeah, jeez. Uh, just Chris and Liam Hemsworth. That. Everybody just starts looking like that. Like, why is everybody looking so good these days on WhatsApp? <laughs> WhatsApp pro- people be putting up WhatsApp profiles and they're putting on Instagram or something <laughs> like that. Who knows what we could get. Uh, then we have MetaQuest 3 takes on Apple Vision Pro in mixed reality multitasking. MetaQuest 3 is trying out up to six different window multitasking solutions. So that might be interesting to you if you're considering replacing some of your working environment with uh, VR and uh, knowing that that multitasking capability might be coming is, is really good especially because you don't have to spend 70,000 Rand on an Apple Vision Pro headset and you might just be able to do it on the much cheaper 15,000 Rand MetaQuest 3 and then uh, that's basically it for today yeah that's a wrap and then obviously a uh, big rugby this afternoon at 5 o'clock with the Springboks taking on Ireland yes will you be watching oh yeah Hell yes. Are Eyes glued to the screen. Yes, dude. absolutely. Yeah, because uh, we, we haven't won uh, Ireland in a, a couple of years or matches. So that's why all eyes on South Africa. And our last match went really afternoon. well, hey? Yeah. I enjoyed watching that one. So for this afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, yeah, all eyes on the Boca to, to make it and actually beat Ireland and uh, do it here on home soil. Uh, at Loftus, of course. So uh, go Booker for this afternoon. And also, Kane, have a lacquer weekend. Uh, thanks as always. It was a great show. We appreciate you. And we'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And, we'll, and thank you to all of our listeners for listening. And we'll see you same time, same place next Absolutely. Week. Please, guys, stay warm. It's freezing out there. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.